Thank you everyone who's joining us. Uh, we are getting our live stream started to Facebook. Uh, we already have 40 people in Zoom, so that is fantastic. Appreciate having you all here. And uh, thank you. By my clock, Josh, we've hit the top of the hour. Do we want to give it another few seconds to let people come in? Yeah, people are still logging in. Okay. So, thank everyone. And we are going live on Facebook now. Confirming we are broadcasting to the event. Yeah. Have the uh, logins tapered off? Yeah, we're at 53 and holding. Okay. Well, how about if we get started so that we're not punishing the people who are on time? Exactly. Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to the second Coast Guard Tech Talks workshop. These workshops are jointly sponsored by the United States Coast Guard, the Coast Guard Auxiliary, and the Boy Scouts of America's Sea Scout program. My name is Bruce Johnson and I serve as the chief of the Coast Guard Auxiliary's youth programs. Our co-host is Josh Gilliland, chair of the National Sea Scout communications and marketing team. Josh will be coordinating your questions in the third part of the program. Coast Guard Tech Talks are held monthly on the fourth Tuesday of the month at 2100 Eastern, 2000 Central, 1900 Mountain, and 1800 Pacific Time. Each program focuses on a single science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or STEM topic. These topics are chosen to support the Sea Scout Advancement Program. Next month's Tech Talks workshop will be on Marine Environment, Ordinary and Able Requirements 12. Tonight's topic is Celestial Navigation. The speaker and organizer of Coast Guard Tech Talks is Lieutenant John DeCastra, U.S. Coast Guard. JD is a Coast Guard uh, rotary wing aviator stationed at Air Station Atlantic City, New Jer Jersey. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Auburn University, where he also began his Coast Guard career in the Auxiliary University program and has been a Coast Guard Auxiliarist since 2010. One last thing, we've muted your microphones to make it easier for everyone to hear. If you have questions, please type them in the chat box. Josh will be monitoring the chat and we'll be able to leave, we will be leaving time to answer your questions at the end. So let's welcome JD DeCastra. Welcome everyone. I know you are probably thinking to yourself, why is an aviator talking about a shipboard topic like celestial navigation? Well, I didn't start out as an aviator. I was on two ships prior to coming here and I have an avid enthusiasm for celestial navigation. So without further ado, we're gonna jump into this and see if we can't share my screen with everyone so you can see kind of what I'm talking about. All right, so celestial navigation, I promise you the whole thing is not going to be a PowerPoint. <clears throat> we're gonna be talking about how celestial navigation works, getting into the theory behind it, why we do the things we do, and then we're gonna quickly talk about how we can correct our gyro azimuth using celestial navigation, how sextants work, and then finally we're gonna finish with finding our longitude with Polaris or the North Star, and then we're gonna dig into our project. Last month I ran long, so I am doing a much better job at timing myself this time so we don't do that again. All right, let's see if, 
All right, can everyone see me? I think I'm still sharing my screen. There's a button. Okay, excellent. So how celestial navigation works. So celestial navigation, we have two spheres that we're concerned with. We have our terrestrial sphere, which is going to be represented by this flight helmet here. So this is the Earth. This is where we live. Then above it, we're going to have the celestial sphere, which is just another sphere directly above it, which contains the stars. Now, we don't really care how far the stars are away or how close they are away. As far as we're concerned, they're just painted on a two-dimensional object. And then once we get that, we have a star, which is hopefully you can see this little sphere up here is going to be our star. And what we're doing is when we are measuring this star, we're what's creating, or we are creating a, what's called a line of equal altitude. So <clears throat> what's happening is when the star is sitting above the earth and we are at this point on the earth, when we measure the height of the star and we get the altitude of it, we know that we are at this angle, whatever it is. And just like a range ring on a radar, you then draw a circle around the earth and that it's gonna create a three-dimensional cone. That cone is called a circle of equal altitude, which if you have a giant map of the whole world, it works out great. You don't need to do a whole lot of math. You don't need to do a whole lot of corrections or assumptions. However, at that scale, the width of your pencil is gonna be a lot of mileage and it's not gonna be accurate whatsoever. So what we do then is we dig into our pups. We have the nautical almanac is one of them, as well as pub 229 is another common one. And what these do is they take this star and they bring it down to the surface of the earth. That's called reducing the star. We're reducing the star down to the center of the earth. So we're taking that three dimensional cone and turning it into a really large range ring, just like we'd get off shooting a range with a radar. However, we still have the same problem of the star might be in the middle of Afri the African continent, but we might be in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. In order to get a chart that large, once again, we can't do it. So what we then do is we take an assumed position. So I know I am right here, right here on the world. I don't know where that is. I know where it's close to. So say, <clears throat> So then what I'm going to do is since I know roughly where I'm at, and I'm using the term roughly to mean 60 to 100 nautical miles away, I'm then going to pick a point where I'm like, okay, I'm going to assume I am at this point right here, which is no. I'm then going to dig back into the publications, and I'm going to find out all the information I can about the height of the star at that specific point. Then I'm going to compare what I should be measuring to what I actually measured, and I'm going to get a range and a bearing from the assumed position to my actual position. You do that three times, you then have a fix. If you only have the sun or the moon, you do a running fix. You take it, you wait a little bit, you take it again, you advance it forward, and then you have a fix as well. So now that we've kind of briefly touched on how we actually are the, the science behind how celestial navigation works, I'm going to put my earth aside and we're going to dig back into the PowerPoint to kind of talk about how the process is that we actually go through that. <clears throat> All right, so let's open the PowerPoint back up. Okay, so the, some good references are the Nautical Almanac, um, Pub 229, Bowditch, the American Practical Navigator, also has large sections about celestial navigation. And the Naval Observatory's website is also a fantastic resource for this. Unfortunately, with the Navy's website, they are currently doing maintenance on it. Their estimated time of repair is sometime this summer, so hopefully soon, knock on wood, cross your fingers, their website will be back up as long with all of the resources contained in there. So now once, when you're actually shooting a fix, you use what's called a navigation strip. And this strip is broken down into multiple different sections. A lot, the vast majority of them are actually just corrections. So correcting for your instrument error, correcting for your altitude, 
correcting for your longitude, your latitude, the time of day, uh, the time of year, et cetera, et cetera. So you're gonna write your body up top. You're going to actually measure the star off of your sextant. You're going to add all of your altitude corrections. And then you're going to get a total latitude correction off of that. You're then gonna jump into your longitude corrections, which are more based off of your time of day, time of month, uh, time of year, date, all of those things where you're accounting for the star moving from east to west across the sky with time. And then you're going to pick your assumed longitude. This assumed longitude is something which is gonna be convenient to you to make the math a lot easier. And once again, it's gonna be, hey, I know I am roughly in this part of the world. I know if I pick this longitude is gonna make my math a lot easier and it's gonna be close enough to where I'm on the same chart. You're then gonna get into your latitude corrections and then you're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna pick a latitude and that latitude is then going to be, once again, something where I know it's close and it's gonna make the math easy to do. You're then going to come in and you're going to compare your measured versus your actual, and then you're gonna get your useful information once you get all of this. If done right, the best I, the quickest I could do one of these strips in was probably 20, 30 minutes. They do make programs which make it a lot easier. And that's one of the reasons why I never got very proficient with the strips is just because it's just not something I, I had to do frequently, but this is the math and this is how you actually go about doing it. So when we actually get down here to our useful information with our A, our Z and our ZN, what exactly does that mean? So I'm gonna have a point right here. This is gonna be called my assumed position, my AP. From this AP, I'm going to get a ZN, or that's going to be a bearing. And this is gonna be the bearing from where my assumed position is to somewhere where my actual position is. You can think of this almost as shooting a line of bearing with an alidate off the, the bridge wing of a ship. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna use this A. This A is gonna be a distance. And that distance can either be towards or away. So once again, celestial navigation is in circles. So if we have two circles up here, if this inner circle is my assumed position, but the outer circle is my actual position, and the center of these circles is gonna be the geographic position of the reduced star on the Earth. So what I mean by that is when the star comes down to the Earth, it has a specific latitude and longitude associated with it. It might be halfway across the world, but it still has a, a position associated with it. This is gonna be the center of these circles. So if my actual position is out way from the geographic position of the star, I'm gonna to have to go this way on the line. If the outer circle were my assumed position and my inner circle were inwards, I would be going towards the star or towards the geographic position. So I'd actually be coming up this way on the line. And you're then gonna mark your A right there. So whatever distance is from here to there is gonna be A. Once again, you get three of those. Let's just draw them up real quick. And I now have a fix somewhere in the middle of all of these three. Once again, just like in taking a fix on any other, with any other body, whether it be radar ranges or lines of bearing, you need three of them to get an actual fix. <clears throat> okay, so now that we have that, we're gonna talk about correcting a gyro with an azimuth. What am I talking about here? So for those who might not be overly familiar with shipboard operations, a gyro is a fancy word for a compass. It's a gyro stabilized compass, which is gonna to point to true north. Unfortunately, there are precession errors associated with gyros. So what we have to do is we have to correct it every now and then. So as we're going, or as the gyro starts to precess, every day aboard ship at sunrise and sunset, we would shoot gyro error. 
and you can do you don't have to do it at sunrise or sunset but essentially what you're doing is when you have a star on the world let me get my earth back up here assume this is east and this is west as the celestial bodies move across the sky they have a specific bearing or an azimuth whether it be true north 360 040590 anywhere in between we know where they are or where they should lie on the compass based off of the charts, the pubs, and a whole bunch of smart people well before me. And then what you do is you will take that and you'll know at that time, typically we choose sunrise and sunset for a number of reasons. One, we know the exact time of sunrise and sunset. Two, it's a lot, e it's easier to see in an alidade. We don't have to tilt the alidade all the way up to look at a body, which is probably 45 degrees up in the sky. The sun is right there at the surface. So you can easily shoot it with an alidade. You mark the time, you mark the bearing, and then you go and you compare it to what you know you should have. So, <clears throat> oh, I exited out of that way too quick. Please pardon my technical errors. All right, let me share my screen again. Okay, so now you can use programs, you can use your nautical almanac, your pub 229, to get the azimuth of your sunrise and sunset, or you can go to Noah's website right here. This is what I'm going to recommend that if you actually want to go out and do this in your own ship on your own boat, if you have the horizon to do so, I would go figure out, calculate the time for your exact latitude and longitude that sunrise and sunset is, and it will give you the azimuth. So then when you're out there and you shoot the azimuth, then you're gonna know, okay, how far, off, how far off am I? How much did my gyro process? And how much I need to recorrect that. Now keep in mind, if you're using a magnetic compass to shoot the line of bearing of the sunset or sunrise, you then have to account for your magnetic variation and deviation. Just keep that in mind. This is meant for true, not magnetic. So next we're going to get into how a sextant works. A sextant is a device that we actually use to measure sunrise and or, uh, I'm sorry, that we actually use to measure Elevation. the angle of a star. So this is a sextant right here. <clears throat> this is a, uh, a heritage item that we actually have here at the air station. And the way the sextant works is, let's see if we have a better picture right here. So we have two mirrors. So this sight glass right here is half mirror, I'm sorry, half mirror and half glass. So when you look through the sight glass, what you're seeing is you're actually seeing a bifurcated picture of the horizon. Half of it, the half with the glass is gonna be actually what you're looking through. And then you also have a mirror in this part right here, which can better be seen here. So you're gonna attach your sight glass to the sextant. You're gonna look through it and part of the reflection is going to bounce off of here back up to here. And notice this mirror is associated with the actual angular measurement device right here. So as you rotate this, that, and that mirror looks more up and to the sky associated with the angle on here. So when you first set up a sextant, you have to find your instrument error. So when you you look it up, you rotate your dials until the horizons are level. You then note what that error is, and it's gonna change frequently, just based upon how you set the sight glass up, the person's eye, and humidity, temperature, all those other things. So that's something you do every time you take a fix. And then as you actually shoot the fix, you do what's called swinging the fix. So we have our horizon right here. And then as you bring this star down, assume that's your star or the sun or the moon, as you rotate that angle up, that moon is gonna come closer and closer. And then you rock the sextant back and forth. So the body is actually going to make a U shape on the horizon. And as you're bringing the star down, rocking it back and forth, as soon as it skims the horizon, you mark the time and you stop, and then you read your sextant, and that is going to be your actual angle. <clears throat> okay, now we're gonna get into finding latitude with Polaris. So I'm gonna briefly talk over this 
or the, the navigation strip. And then I'm actually going to get into the more practical aspect for what we can do with the project. So just like at the beginning of it, we're going to have our body, we're gonna have Polaris, which is gonna be the North Star. And the North Star is a special star because it only changes about one to two degrees throughout the day where it is in relation to North. So it's part of the day, twice a day, it's exactly at 360. And then it moves from plus or minus one to, to I'm sorry, minus one or minus two to plus one or plus two. And it's very constant. That's why it's called North Star typically always points to north, at least close enough to north. Now, <clears throat> just like the other ones, you're gonna go through all of your instrumentation errors. You're gonna get your altitude correction, your height observed, you're gonna go and you're gonna get your longitudinal corrections. And then you're gonna go into your nautical almanac or your pubs, and you're gonna get three more correction factors, A0, A1, A2, A2 you're gonna add all these together and then you're always gonna tack on a negative one. Don't ask me why, that's someone smarter than me figured that out, but you always add the negative one. <clears throat> you're then gonna get your total corrections. You're gonna add all these up, get your total corrections, and then you're gonna add that to your height observed and you're gonna get what you're at, or you're gonna, I'm sorry, you're gonna add that to your HA, which is gonna be your apparent height and you're gonna get your height observed. The height observed is equal to your latitude. So if you're at 35 degrees latitude, and once you go through all that math and all those charts, you're going to come up with 35 degrees. <clears throat> now here's where I get into the more practical aspect with the project we're gonna be doing. At best, or I'm sorry, at worst, your correction factor is only gonna be about negative 1.5, maybe negative two, but highly unlikely. It's gonna be really close to one. One degree of latitude is equal to 60 nautical miles, which might seem like a lot. And it is, if you're in coastal waters, 60 nautical miles could be the difference between running up on a shoal or being safely in a channel. When you're out in the open ocean, 60 nautical miles is, I mean, I'm perfect. I'm in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, in the middle of the Atlantic, or I'm on the east par eastern part of the Atlantic. It's not as much big of a deal. And why it's not a big of a deal for our project, as you're gonna see, the accuracy in which we are gonna get with what we're the, the sextant we're gonna make is not going to justify going through all of those math, all the math, all the corrections and all the tables to actually go about doing this. Now, I still highly encourage you as an academic exercise to definitely dig in there. Um, the Naval Observatory used to have online publications of the Nautical Almanac to where you can actually download them and get in there and do this. And I really hope once their new website comes back up online, they will still provide that service so that way you can actually dig into it. If not, a quick Google search might get you the current nautical almanac or it might get you an older one where you can still get pretty close and you can kind of go through the math and go through the academic exercise. And this is kind of what a table in the nautical almanac will look like. It's gonna be broken down into your different days. So this is a 2003 one for March 14, 15, and 16. For the specific example of um, Polaris is kind of where I'm going with, with these cutouts. So your Aries is gonna be your GHA. And that's just essentially where in the sky for that portion of the year is gonna be, is going to be our, our zero point, or our correction factor for our longitude. And you also have your different, you have your planets, your stars, and on the other side of the page, you're gonna have your sun and your moon data. And then when we get our A1, our A0, I'm sorry, our A0, A1, and A2, this is what the table is gonna to be to look like. So you're gonna find your LHA, which you get from your navigation strip. You're gonna to go to where you are, and you're just gonna follow them all the way down till you get your actual correction factors. <clears throat> Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to jump into this project. So what we're going to be doing is we're actually going to be making a sextant. You can go online and you can get a printout of a protractor. 
For those who are joining us last week, you'll remember I tried very hard to find a protractor and failed. And then I realized I could download one, print it, cut it out, and simple protractor. So what I did was I downloaded one of those, printed it out, and I taped it to a piece of cardboard. Now when you do this, you wanna make sure that your cardboard is flat. Because what we're gonna do is we're gonna attach a straw. I actually used a pin in my case to the top of it. If that is not flat, if it's angled, when you look through your straw to actually shoot the star, you're gonna get variations and your readings won't be as accurate as it should be. So try and get that as straight as possible. Or if you're using an actual protractor, they come fairly straight so you don't have to worry about it. So once you get your protractor, what you're gonna do is you're gonna tape a straw, or in my case, I took apart a pin to the top of it. So that way you can go and you can look through the straw or the, or the pin, and you can actually see your body or whatever it is that you're trying to measure the height of. Then I'm going to punch a hole. I just grabbed a thumbtack and I punched a hole right into the center point of the protractor right there. You want it center if it's more towards one side or the other. When you actually go to tilt it, your measurement is going to be off and it's not going to give you as an accurate of a measurement. Just like most things in life, the effort put in is going to equal the quality and effort that's taken out of it. If you sloppily do it, you're gonna get sloppy results. If you take the time to do it nice, you're gonna get much nicer results. You're then gonna take a string, and you're going to push it through the hole. Let's see if I can have the dexterity to do this on camera. So as you can see, I have some string going through the hole. I'm then gonna tie a series of half hitches to prevent the string from going through back through the hole. And then you're gonna attach some weights to the bottom of it. You can use a pin cap, you can use a nut, you can use a screw. In this case, I have some little plastic things that I put onto the end of it. So what's gonna happen is your finished product is gonna look something like, it's gonna look something like this. And then when you go to actually shoot the star, you're gonna look through the, the pinhole at the body you're shooting. In this instance, it's gonna be Polaris. And then as you're standing, you're going to as you look up, this is going to tilt. And then as it tilts, it's going to be, the string's gonna be hanging freely and it's actually gonna be hanging past one of your angles. Now in the configuration I did it, zero point is actually here. So if you do it like this, you're just gonna to have to remember, zero degrees is actually gonna be 90 degrees. So you have to add a 90 degree correction. If you want to do it the other way, you can cut this in half and put your easier just to do math in my head instead of trying to get a straight cut to match it up with a straight line. Too many steps adds too many areas for error. You're then going to go out and you're going to look up at players through your straw and you can then either have a friend or a shipmate read off the device or read off the angle for you, or you can stick your finger on it, hold it as still as best you can, and get down and look at it. <clears throat> now what I would then do is since we know that negative one correction factor is always there, once you get your reading, get it as close as you can with uh, this one specifically, the best I can get is to the nearest 0.5 and then subtract that negative one from it. So if it were 35.5, I would then have 34.5. And that 34.5 is then going to be my latitude. Now I have five minutes left before we get into the Q&A. So I'm just gonna give a brief little history about why finding Polaris is in longitude is much easier in the realm of celestial navigation. <clears throat> And up until the 1800s, you actually could not find your long longitude, latitude, long yeah, longitude, I'm sorry. I think I've been mixing longitude and latitude the entire time. Polaris is to find your latitude, not your longitude. If I've been making that mistake the past 25 minutes, please disregard it is latitude, not longitude for Polaris. <clears throat> So what that was is in order to find your or latitude, you only needed to be able to find the height of an object. 
So back in the olden days of wooden ships, that's the best thing they could do. They would find, they'd measure local apparent noon, they'd measure the height of Polaris, and they'd know what latitude they were at, and they would take dead reckonings based off of the speed. They'd throw a rope into the water and count the number of knots that went through in an hourglass of time, hence the term knots. You would then dead reckon for the entirety of the day until you got to the next point to where you could measure your longitude. You'd then measure your longitude, estimate your latitude, Measure your latitude, estimate your longitude. I'm still making that mistake. I need more coffee. And it's already nine o'clock at night where I'm at. <clears throat> you then measure your latitude, estimate your longitude, and you track that latitude all the way into whatever port you were going into because you knew the latitude of your port. You just didn't know where in the world you were. And there are several sailing accidents that happened in the Royal Navy where the navigators got their longitude wrong and they actually ran into shoal water killing numerous people sinking numbers of ships. And it all it is also the reason why pirates back in the day could be so successful when the ocean is so large because they knew the latitude of the ports were the most expensive and the best goods were coming into so they would just hang out around that latitude knowing the ships would be tracking that latitude into the port. And that's why it's relatively easy to find our latitude with Polaris or local apparent noon using similar methods. It wasn't until the advent where we got accurate timekeepers that we could find longitude because time is essential to finding longitude based off of Greenwich Mean Time or your uh, prime meridian. Everything you do with your longitude is based off of that time. If you don't have an accurate time, it's impossible to find your longitude. So once we actually got an accurate timekeeper, an accurate clock that could make a transatlantic voyage was when we could actually start finding our longitude. So, and with that, I think we will open it up for questions. Okay, well, we have a uh, question starting to come in. So let's take a look at some of the first that we have. So. so uh, JD, a lot of folks believe that, hey, we have handheld GPSs. Why is celestial navigation important in today's world given the amount of control and information that we can walk around with in the palm of our hand? Call me a cynic, but it's redundancy. Um, I can't tell you how many times I have been aboard ship. We have lost all power. We've had either, whether it be a main space fire where all both generators go down, we're fighting to save the ship and say, where are we in the world? I'm not really sure. Even in the helicopters, I can't tell you how many times I've had navigation equipment fail. And yes, we have some redundancies built into it, but this is a redundancy which never fails. I mean, the stars are always going to be there. We're always going to have a way to measure the height of those stars. And you know what? All this stuff is in hardback paper applications. You can also call me a cynic in the fact that being as part of a military branch, we're always thinking also of, okay, adversaries. How easy is it to knock out a satellite? Fairly easy compared to knocking out a star. How easy is it to destroy a ship's electro, uh, electronic navigation equipment? Very easy. On the civilian side, it's even possible to hijack a ship without the ship's captain or the ship's crew knowing about it. You can, they, the technologies exist where you can manipulate GPS systems aboard ships and make the ship think it's somewhere where it's not. It's areas like this where hey, going out once every four hours, taking a fix off of a star, be like, whoa, I am 300 miles off of where I'm expected to be. Something's not right here. And then it starts begging the question. You start thinking more of, okay, what's actually going on? And same thing, even without the whole, uh, the threat level, even just normal navigation. GPSs fail, equipment fails. Um, and a lot of times it's just a nuance thing which is showing wrong which you can often overlook 
um, a good example is there was a ship where the GPS failed. It wasn't receiving rain or it wasn't receiving um, satellite data. However, the ship knew the course and the speed that it was supposed to be going. So the GPS was dead reckoning. No one aboard the ship realized it until they ran into shoal water and they were 30, 40 miles off. So for those who also have questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A uh, icon. So click that and, and type away uh, your questions. Uh, so while more are coming in, here's a practical one that many people don't realize or, or even think about. And does sunset occur when the sun actually disappears below the horizon? No, it does not. Um, that is a common misconception. When the sun disappears below the horizon, you're actually past sunset. <clears throat> and the reason is, is the refraction of the light due to the curvature of the earth. So when sunset is, is actually when about two thirds of the sun is visible above the horizon. If you were to go look at the NOAA site or calculate your sunrise or sunset, that is when you're actually going to have official sunset is that when two thirds of the sun is above the horizon. Okay. Do you, you have a relative, relatively inexpensive sextant you can recommend? Unfortunately, I do not. I wish I did because I am such a nerd that if I could find one, I would gladly own multiple. Yeah, and I would recommend check eBay because people post those frequently and in, when we get back to having nautical flea markets, they frequently turn up there. Another question that came in, uh, this one came in in chat. Uh, could you explain about star time and how to identify a starter shoe? <laughs> that is a very complicated question. And to be honest with you, it took me about three or four patrols reading a star map to be able to actually pinpoint the stars. The best advice I can give to you and which I used is find the stars and the constellations which are easiest first. So most of your constellations, like one that I could always find very easily is Orion. You have multiple stars which you can navigate off of based off of where Orion's belt is. Um, so, and that's a fairly common constellation to see. So once you find that one, you know, okay, now I have that repertoire of stars. Then another big one is the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper, you have three or four stars which you can navigate off of, one of which is Polaris or the North Star. And then you also have another constellation, which for me is easy to find is Scorpio. And off of Scorpio, you have one or two stars as well. Um, so you have those options, and then once you kind of learn where the more major constellations are, you can kind of pinpoint and pick out some of the, the more harder to find ones, in my opinion. And a good thing to remember is the stars in which you typically navigate off of are the brighter ones. Um, so they'll also be the ones which appear first in the sky and should be relatively the most notable. Now, there are some, there are always exceptions. And the last advice I can say, just because those star date calendars and charts are very confusing, is uh, there are multiple apps out there that actually work very well at pinpointing stars. So that's also a good resource you can use, which is a lot more user friendly than those charts. Next one is a fun historical one, just showing my nerdiness because on, on how to try to answer this, but how are the differences and similar similarities with the Polynesians who did wayfinding uh, by stars compared to celestial navigation. It's, I am not entirely familiar with how the Polynesians did it. Um, I, I know they used, instead of using measuring equipments, they measured angles off of hands. So I would imagine the principles would be the same. You're, you have a known, star that has a known latitude at a specific time and then just based off of the historical knowledge passed on from generation to generation depending upon what type of season it was where that that altitude was based off of your hand would give you a, a latitude and then you would then track that latitude to whatever island you were trying to find here's a technical one how has uh, parallax dealt with if as you explained 
it, celestial navigation uses the solar sphere, a flat visualization of many levels of stars. Oh, all right. I'm going to try my best to answer this one. I might have to try and share my screen again. Let's see. All right, here we go. No matter how many times I use this, I am not a tech person. So let me get to a blank slide. Actually, you know what? We'll just use this slide right here. So there are multiple different horizons. Let us get her pin back out. So we're gonna have our sphere here. And I may or may not butcher this, so please do not take everything I say as gospel and the truth. I, it's very possible I'm gonna make a mistake with the, the specific horizons. And we're gonna have a person, and y'all are also gonna get to see my lovely artistic abilities. I promise you with an actual pen and pencil, it's not any better. So we're gonna have multiple horizons. So we're gonna have a horizon there. We're gonna have a horizon here. And then we're gonna have a horizon here. So these are our three different horizons. And I'm not even gonna to attempt to name these two because honestly, they're not overly important unless you wanna dig into the math behind it. But for the parallax error, what we are concerned with, particularly in celestial navigation, is our visible or visual horizon. And that's going to be this right here. So I believe the, the kind of the, the intent of what you're getting behind is how do we compensate for, okay, I'm five foot tall on a 50 foot ship. So now my height of eye is 50 feet versus someone who is six feet tall on a 60 foot bridge whose head is up here. So now their visual horizon is going to encompass all of this area right here and just the disparity in that, how do we actually compensate for that? And that's in your altitude or your height of eye correction. Um, let me try and get back up to my script right here. So, um, so up in here is where you're actually going to account for your altitude correction. And Let's see if I can't quickly find that chart in the pub 229. Um, but essentially, there is going to be a chart for it where you know your height of eye, you know where you're at, and then you're going to be able to compensate for that. Um, so once again, it's going to go back to the charts, knowing the height of your bridge wing, knowing how tall you are, and then throwing those into the chart and compensating for the differences of your visual horizons. I hope that answered the question. And that I, yeah, I think I stopped sharing. Excellent. <clears throat> well done. Next up, how many sites can you, well, hold on, there's a typo. How many sites can your position with a single site, such as the noon site of the sun? Um, not entirely. Sh I'm going to take a stab in the dark. And if I don't answer the question, what you're trying to get at, please re-ask it. Um, but what I, I think that's meaning is how many different site reductions can you do at a time or how many fixes can you take? Um, so I'll, I'll answer that two ways. If you're doing it off of a sun line, so you can reduce, say you have a single body, you can do a moon line or a sun line you can do that multiple times. So just like any other running fix, say it's eight o'clock in the morning, you reduce the sun, you go through the math and you calculate your, your uh, line of position based off of the sun. 15 minutes later goes by, 30 minutes later is go by depending upon how frequently your commanding officer or your ship's captain makes you take fixes. You reduce the sun, you go through the same process, you now then have another sun line. You advance your first one forward. 30 minutes later go by, you do it again. You advance three, your net last two. And you can do this for as long as you want to and as long as your chart is going to allow. Because at some point you're just gonna have so many marks on your chart, it's gonna be useless. And you're not even gonna be able to tell anything. Um, now when it comes to stars, you have, you can reduce as many stars as you want to. So there are a few things that go into play here. One, the best time to reduce a star is gonna be your nautical twilight. 
in nautical twilight is going to be when the sun is 12 degrees below the horizon, or the center of the sun is 12 degrees below the horizon. Practically speaking, what does that mean? An hour after sunset is, is a good rule of thumb. 30 minutes after sunset, you hit your civil twilight. Some of your more bright stars start to show up, such as, um, or even your planets. So you might get Jupiter, Venus, Cyrus, or Sirius, however you pronounce it. I'm from Alabama. Please don't take my pronunciations to the bank. <clears throat> um, and then nautical twilights, when you start having a lot more of your first order or your first, first magnitude, I think it's order, stars come out, your brighter ones, which you typically navigate off of. And the benefit of nautical twilight is you still have a horizon where you can easily and accurately bring that star down to. Once you get into full blown nighttime, that horizon can disappear unless you have a very bright moon. So you can take as many fixes off of stars or reduce as many stars as you possibly can in that time period that you're given. And when you do it, if you want a good fix, there are some criteria. You want your stars roughly 60 degrees off based on the azimuth and no higher than about 45 degrees and higher than about 10 to five de or about 10 degrees roughly. And that's just drastically increases the accuracy of both the fix and of the actual reducing of the star. Going to uh, the Northern Hemisphere, do you know how the Vikings used to navigate? Um, no, but I am gonna take a stab based off of the history documentary series, The Vikings, in which I watched. Um, so by no means is this historical fact, but this is, it makes sense to me the way they did it in the show. And since it's a History Channel show, I presume it's based somewhat in, in history. But they used uh, same thing as local apparent noon. So what I believe happened is they had a, essentially like a sundial um, floating on a jar where they would mark as the sun passed local apparent noon, the highest point of the day, they would mark where that shadow went. You'd go the next day, you'd mark where the shadow was. If the shadow moved left or right, that would mean that you were now off of your latitude. So you'd either be more north or more south. They use, that we currently use today, just with a lot more rudimentary of tools. And the tool might be wrong, and it, it might have been something completely different, but it was it was the same principle of, all right, how high is the sun? I want to keep the sun as high as it is consistently throughout my entire voyage to actually stay on the same latitude. Next up, how do you find latitude and longitude with a sextant? And this mm -hmm. person might have missed part of the discussion. Um, so that is going to be coming back to our navigation strip. Um, so when we get here, what you're going to do is to actually walk through. So first you're going to find the correction error of your sextant. You're going to go out, you're going to make your horizons match on the sextant. You're going to note what that instrument correction error is. You're then going to identify the three stars in which you want to take a fix of. You're then going to mark a time. I recommend the top of an hour. So if say, for example, uh, using our current time, civil twilight starts around 2100 or 9 p.m. local time. So I'm gonna start my clock right at the top of 2100. I'm gonna start a stopwatch. I'm gonna go out. I'm gonna find my first star. I'm gonna reduce it down to the horizon. As soon as I get it there, I'm gonna say mark. And either my quartermaster or someone else on the bridge or even myself included, is going to note at the specific time that I said mark to the second. If you have more accurate, the more accurate, the better. You're then going to make notes of that. You're going to go to your second star. You're going to bring that down, say mark, note the time, note the altitude or the, the degrees on your sextant. You're going to go to your third body, bring it down, mark, note the time, note the angle. And then you're going to come back in here. You're going to come to your navigation strip. You're going to write the body. Your GMT time right here is going to be that time that you marked plus whatever your start time was. So in say the example we're giving, the start time was 2100. 
it took me five minutes and 40 seconds to reduce my first fix. So my GMT time is going to be 21.05 and 40 seconds plus whatever my Zulu correction is. In my case, it'd be plus four Zulu. So it would then be, I'd have to go to the next day where it'd be 0.10540. And then I'm going to add my instrument error. I'm going to have my height of eye, my dip error. I'm going to add all of these up. I'm going to go into my pubs. I'm going to get my height correction which is then going to give me my altitude or my latitude correction. I'm then going to go into my longitude corrections where I'm going based off of my Aries angle or my uh, Greenwich hour angle. I'm going to go through, so Greenwich hour angle, my sedhedral hour angle, I'm going to get my total Greenwich hour angle. I'm then going to add or subtract 360 based upon um, what makes sense at the time. So you, you want it less than 360, so you might have to add, you might have to subtract. I'm going to get my assumed longitude. I'm going to get my latitude corrections. I'm going to get my assumed latitude and I'm going to start comparing. And this goes back to earlier where it's, I have my geographic position where the center of the star is. I have two circles that I could be anywhere on this circle based on the altitude of the star. And then I'm going to have but one's going to be my assumed position, one's going to be my actual. I'm then going to use the charts and the publications to get the difference between my assumed and my measured, where I'm going to get my assumed position. I'm going to have some type of bearing off of my geographic position, and then I'm going to have some type of distance, which is going to be my A, and that's either going to be away from the geographic position or towards the geographic position. Um, hopefully that, that kind of clarifies uh, from earlier on in the session. <clears throat> Excellent. So next up is, can you explain how to reduce a celestial body to the horizon again? Okay, so we're gonna come back and share so I can draw um and please if the drawings are not helping just let me know why is that oh, there we go all right let me come to so let's get my pen back up so when you're actually looking through the site of your sextant you are going to see the horizon on one side and your body on the other side. And then as you move your sextant arm, this body is gonna move up or down. And then typically when it moves down, your angle is increasing on the sextant. So you're going from zero degrees up to 90 degrees or somewhere in between. And then as you're moving the star down, so as you're changing the angle on the sextant, you begin to rock it back and forth. Um, so as you, assuming this is your sextant, you're going to be rocking it back and forth just like this. And then what that's going to do <clears throat> is it's going to cause this star to make a U shape. And the reason you do that is because if you have, since you're dealing with angles, if you're holding it off at a cockeyed angle, you're going to be actually measuring it somewhere up in this point right here. Whereas if it's cockeyed the other way, it's going to be somewhere up in this area when you want the bottom of that dip. So as you're rocking it back and forth, it's ensuring that you get the bottom of the swing. It's uh, called swinging a star or I'm going to go swing a fix or some of the terms that you may or may not hear. But then you're going to move that down until the bottom of the body at the lowest point on the swing is just touching the horizon. And that's gonna be the altitude of your star, or the height of your star. Thank you. That is, I'm just double checking. I think that was our last question. Oh. Found two in the chat. What does local apparent noon give you and what celestial body do you use to calculate it? 
okay, so local apparent noon is based off of the sun. Um, and it's noon, it's, it's high noon. So local apparent noon is when the sun is at its highest point in the sky. Um, and we're gonna go back into the PowerPoint because this is the only way I know how to draw. Um, I'm sure all the more technologically advanced people are making fun of me because I'm sure there's a much easier way to do this than in the PowerPoint. So the sun is gonna track up over the sky, just like this. It's gonna be here in the morning and here in the evening. <clears throat> and the highest point the sun is gonna be in the sky is going to be noon. Now noon is not always at 12 o'clock. It's somewhere close, but not always at 12. And when you're measuring that, that is, once again, you know the exact time of local apparent noon. It's calculated, it's easy to do, and it's consistent. Even back in the day, you'd have people on, on land observatories which would track and measure the sun so often that they figured out the mathematics of where to find how high the sun was, at what part of the world you were in, at what specific time. And the benefit of doing local apparent noon is you don't need a clock because the sun will track across the sky at 15 degrees an hour. So that means at zero degrees longitude, and then say we're coming west to 15 degrees of longitude, that transit time is going to be precisely one hour. So because of that, every 15 degrees, I know is going to happen, say for example, it just so has to happen at noon for this day. At Greenwich, England is going to happen at noon. I go west 15 degrees, it's going to happen at one hour after noon. Greenwich mean time, noon my time. 15 degrees later, it's going to happen again at that exact same time. And since the sun consistently moves across the sky at the same rate, if I'm halfway in between here, okay, well, local apparent noon is no longer at noon, it's going to be at 1130. So now that I know the exact time, of local apparent noon, I know when I need to go out to the bridge wing and I need to start shooting the sun. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna start shooting it when it's over here and you're gonna finish shooting it when it's over here. So you're gonna keep shooting, you're gonna, you're gonna swing it, you're gonna swing it, you're gonna swing it. And the second you have to move that sextant in the opposite direction, you stop. Because that is local apparent noon. You can then use that to get your <clears throat> latitude off of, or if you noted the time when you first started swinging and you know the time that it happened, you can then go through the simple math of, okay, 15 degrees per hour. It took me 30 minutes, 33 seconds, and two seconds. All right, let me go crunch some numbers, and that is now my longitude as well. So in 20 seconds, can you say what changes when you were in the Southern Hemisphere for celestial navigation? Uh, a lot of the stars change. Um, and that's gonna be your, your biggest difference. The method, the math all works the same. It's just the stars are different. And you can even start seeing Southern Hemisphere stars even when you're in the Northern Hemisphere. So when I was um, doing counter drug patrols off the coast of Columbia, you could see the Southern Cross even though we were in the Northern Hemisphere. So you can still get the star, the southern stars in the northern hemisphere, but the biggest thing is going to be your stars are going to be different. Everything else remains the same. Fantastic. Well, JD, want to thank you for your time. We have uh, more uh, webinars coming up in the near future. Uh, on July 28th, we have an environmental one, and that will be a lot of fun. Hope you can join us. And there's the basic info right now. And if you uh, sign up, we'll go up very, very soon. So watch for that. And we will also have more uh, in the near future uh, throughout the month of July. So thank you all for tuning in. Stay tuned for more. And uh, Bruce, any closing comments?
No, th thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, JD. That was really uh, informative. I have a sextant in my closet that I've been dying to learn how to use. Maybe this will motivate me to, to spend a little bit of quality time with it. If you ever so, find yourself in New Jersey, we'll have some fun. I'd love to. Okay, thank you very much, JD. And thank you also, Josh, for your help with this. And thanks everyone for tuning in and we'll see you next time.